Milton, Red by Adriana Díaz Enciso, Part 2 Then on the verge of Beulah he beheld his own shadow, a mournful form double, hermaphroditic, male and female in one wonderful body, and he entered into it in direful pain, for the dread shadow, twenty-sevenfold reached to the depths of direst hell, and thence to Albion's land, which is this earth of vegetation on which now I write. The seven angels of the presence wept over Milton's shadow. As when a man dreams, he reflects not that his body sleeps, else he would wake. So seemed he entering his shadow, but with him the spirits of the seven angels of the presence entering, they gave him still perceptions of his sleeping body, which now arose and walked with them in Eden, as an aid image divine though darkened, and the walking as one walks in sleep, and the seven comforted and supported him, like as a polypus that vegetates beneath it, they saw his shadow vegetated underneath the house of death. For when he entered into shadow, himself, his real and immortal self, was as appeared to those who dwell in immortality, as one sleeping on a couch of gold, and those in immortality gave forth their emanations like females of sweet beauty, to guard round him and to feed his lips with the food of Eden in his cold and dim repose. But to himself he seemed a wanderer lost in dreary night. Onwards his shadow kept his course among the spectres, called Satan. But swift as lightning passing them, startled the shades of hell, beheld him in a trail of light as of a comet that travels into chaos. So Milton went guarded within. The nature of infinity is this that everything has its own vortex, and when once a traveller through eternity has passed that vortex, he perceives it roll backward behind his path into a globe itself enfolding, like a sun, or like a moon, or like a universe of starry majesty, while he keeps onwards in his wondrous journey on the earth, or like a human form, a friend with whom he lives benevolent. As the eye of man views both the east and west encompassing its vortex, and the north and south with all their starry host, also the rising sun and setting moon he views surrounding his cornfields and his valleys of five hundred acres square. Thus is the earth one infinite plain, and not as apparent to the weak traveller confined beneath the moony shade. Thus is the heaven a vortex pass already, and the earth a vortex not yet pass by the traveller through eternity. First Milton saw Albion upon the rock of ages, deadly pale outstretched and snowy cold, storm cover, a giant form of perfect beauty outstretched on the rock in solemn death. The sea of time and space thundered aloud against the rock, which was engrupped with the wheels of that, hovering over the cold bosom. In its vortex Milton bent down to the bosom of that. What was underneath soon seemed above. A cloudy heaven mingled with stormy seas in loudest ruin. But as a wintry glow with the sands precipitant through the bursting with thunders loud and terrible, so Milton's shadow fell, precipitant loud thundering into the sea of time and space. Then first I saw him in the zenith as a falling star, descending perpendicular, swift as a swallow or swift, and on my left foot falling on the tarsus, entered there. But from my left foot a black cloud redounding spread over Europe. Then Milton knew that the heavens of Beulah were beheld by him on earth this bright pilgrimage of sixty years. In those three females whom his wives, in those three whom his daughters had represented and contained, 
that they might be resumed by giving up the selfhood, and they distant viewed his journey in their eternal spheres, now human, though their bodies remained closed in the dark horror till the judgment. Also Milton knew they and himself was human, though now wandering through that veil in conflict with those female forms which in blood and jealousy surrounded him, dividing and uniting without end or number. He saw the cruelties of Uro, and he wrote them down in iron tablets, and his wife's and daughter's names were these, Rahab and Tirza, and Milka and Mela and Noah and Hogla. They sat round round him as the rocks of horror ground the land of Canaan, and they wrote in smoke and fire his dictate, and his body was the rock Sinai. That body, which was on earth born to corruption, and his six females, are Or and Peor and Bashan and Abarim and Lebanon and Hermon, seven rocky masses terrible in the deserts of Midian. But Milton's human shadow continued journeying above the rocky masses of the mundane shell. In the lands of Edom and Aram and Moab and Midian and Amalek, the mundane shell is a vast concave earth, an immense hardened shadow of all upon our vegetated earth, enlarged into dimension and deformed into indefinite space, in twenty-seven heavens and all their hells, with chaos and ancient night and purgatory. It is a cavernous earth of labyrinthine intricacy, twenty-seven folds of opaqueness and finishes where the lark mounts. Here Milton journeyed in that region called Midian, among the rocks of Horeb, for travelers from eternity pass outward to Satan's seat. But travelers to eternity pass inward to Golgonunse. Lost the vehicular terror beheld him, and divine in its harmon called all her daughters, saying, Surely don't lose my bond if this man come. Satan shall be on loose upon Albion. Lost heard in terror and its harmon's words, in febrile strength his limbs shot forth like roots of trees against the forward path of Milton's journey. Eurysian beheld the mortal man, and Tharmas, demon of the waters, and Orc, who is Luva. The shouty female, seeing Milton, howled in her lamentation over the deeps, outstretching her twenty-seven heavens over Albion. And thus the shouty female howls in articulate howlings. I will lament over Milton in the lamentation of the afflicted. My garments shall be woven of sighs and heartbroken lamentations. The misery of unhappy families shall be thrown out into its border, wrought with an evil, with thy sufferings, poverty, to pain and woe, along the rocky island. And thence throughout the whole earth there shall be the sick father and his starving family. There the prisoner in the stone dungeon and the slave at the mill I will have writings written all over it in human words that every infant that is born upon the earth shall read and get by road as a hard task of a life of sixty years. I will have kings in woven upon it and counsellors and mighty men. The women shall clasp it together with buckles and clasps, and the pestilence shall be its fringe and the war is girdle to divide into Rahab and Tirsa that Milton may come to our tents. For I will put on the human form and take the image of God, even pity and humanity, but my clothes shall be cruelty, and I will put on holiness as a breastplate and as a helmet, and all my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts, and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and debt, and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear to defend me from terrors. O Ork, my only beloved. Ork answer, Take not the human form, O loveliest. Take not terror upon thee. Behold how I am, and tremble, lest thou also consume in my consummation. But thou mayst take a form female and lovely, that cannot consume in man's consummation. 
Wherefore wast thou created and weaved this Satan for a covering? When thou attemptest to put on the human form, my wrath burns to the top of heaven against thee in jealousy and fear. Then I rend thee asunder, then I howl over thy clay and ashes. When wilt thou put on the female form, as in times of old, with a garment of pity and compassion like the garment of God? His garments are long sufferings for the children of men. Jerusalem is his garment and not thy covering care of. O lovely shadow of my delight who wanders sick for the prey. So spoke Ork when Earthon and Luther hovered over his couch of fire in interchange of beauty and perfection in the darkness opening interiorly into Jerusalem and Babylon, shining glorious in the shadowy female's bosom. Jealous her darkness grew. Howlings filled all the desolate places in accusations of sin, in female beauty shining in the unformed void and orc in vain stretched out his hands of fire and wood. They triumph in his pain. Dust darkened the shower the female tenfold and orc tenfold glowed on his rocky couch against the darkness. Loud thunders told of the enormous conflict, earthquake beneath. Around, rent the mortal females limb from limb and joint from joint, and moved the fast foundations of the earth to wake the dead. Eurison emerged from his rocky form and from his nose, and he also darkened his brows, freezing dark rocks between the footsteps and in fixing deep the feet in marble beds. But Milton labored with his journey and his feet bled sore upon the clay now changed to marble. Also Eurystheus rose and met him on the shores of Arnon and by the streams of the brooks. Silent they met, and silent strove among the streams of Arnon even to Mahanaim, when with cold hand Eurystheus stooped down and took up water from the river Jordan pouring on to Milton's brain the icy fluid from his broad, cold palm. But Milton took off the red clay of Sukkoth, moulding it with a curve between his palms, and filling up the furrows of many years, beginning at the feet of Eurison, and on the bones creating new flesh of the demon cold, and building him, as with new clay, a human form in the valley of Beth Pell. Four universes round the moon and egg remain chaotic. One to the north named Urthona. One to the south named Eurison. One to the east named Luva. One to the west named Tarmas. They are the four soas that stood around the throne divine. But when Luva assumed the world of Eurison to the south, and Albion was slain upon his mountains, and in his tent all fell toward the center in dire ruin, sinking down. And in the south remains a burning fire, in the east a void, in the west a world of raging waters, in the north solid, unfathomable, without end. But in the midst of this, is built eternally the universe of Lowe's and Danny Tarman, towards which Milton went. But Eurison opposed his path. The man and demon strove many periods. Rahab beheld standing on Carmel. Rahab and Tirsa trembled to behold the enormous strife, one giving life, the other giving death to his adversary. And they set forth all their sons and daughters in all their beauty to entice Milton across the river. The twofold form, hermaphroditic, and the double sexed, the female male and the male female, self dividing, stood before him in their beauty and the cruelties of holiness, shining in darkness, glorious upon the deeps of Antithon, saying, Come thou to Ephraim, behold the kings of Canaan. 
the beautiful Amalekites behold the fires of youth bound with a chain of jealousy by laws and any term. The banks of Cannes, cold learning streams, London's dark frowning towers slammed upon the winds of Europe in Refheim's veil, because Sahania rent apart into a desolate night. Laments and Enian wanders like a weeping, inarticulate voice, and Vela labors for her bread and water among the furnaces. Therefore, bright tears have triumphs, putting on all beauty and all perfection in her cruel sports among the victims. Come bring with thee Jerusalem with songs on the Grecian lyre, in natural religion, in experiments on men. Let her be offered up to holiness. Tears and numbers her. She numbers with her fingers every fiber ere it grow. Where is the Lamb of God? Where is the promise of His coming? Her shadowy sisters form the bones, even the bones of horror, around the marrow and the orb skull around the brain. His images are born for war, for sacrifice to Tirsa, to natural religion, to Tirsa, the daughter of Rahab the Holy. She ties the knot of nervous fibers into a white brain. She ties the knot of bloody veins into a red-hot heart. Within her bosom, Albion lies and bomb, never to awake. And is become a rock. Sinai and horror is high and coven. Scofield is bound in iron armor before Reuben's gate. She ties a knot of milky seed into two lovely heavens, two yet but one. Each in the other sweet reflected. These are all three heavens beneath the shades of Beulah, land of rest. Come then to Ephraim and Manasseh, O beloved one. Come to my ivory palaces, O beloved of thy mother. And let us bind thee in the bands of war and be thou king of Canaan and reign in a hazel where the twelve tribes meet. So spoke they as in one voice. Silent Milton stood before the darkened Eurizen, as the sculptor Silent stands before his forming image. He walks round it, patient, laboring. Thus Milton stood, forming bright Eurizen, while his mortal part sat frozen in the rock of horror, and his redeemed portion thus from the clay of Eurizen. But within that portion, his really human walked above in power and majesty, though darkened, and the seven angels of the presence attended him. Oh, how can I, with my gross tongue that cleaved to the dust, tell of the fourfold man, in starry numbers fifthly order? Or how can I, with my cold hand of clay? But thou, O oh Lord, do with me as thou wilt. For I am nothing, and vanity. If thou choose to elect a worm, it shall remove the mountains. For that portion named the elect, the spectrous body of Milton, redounding from my left foot into Lowe's moon and space, brooded over his body in horror against the resurrection, preparing it for the great consummation. Read the carob on Sinai glow but in terrors folded round his clouds of love. Now Albion's sleeping humanity began to turn upon his couch, feeling the electric flame of Milton's awful precipitate descent. Seest thou the little winged fly, smaller than a grain of sand? It has a heart like thee, a brain open to heaven and hell. Within sigh wondrous and expansive, its gates are not closed. I hope thine are not. Hence it clothes itself in rich array. Hence thou art clothed with human beauty, O thou mortal man. Seek not thy heavenly Father then beyond the skies. There chaos dwells in ancient night and awe and anarch old. For every human heart has gates of brass and bars of adamant, which few there unbear because dread oak and anak guard the gates terrific. 
and his mortal brain is whirled and motored around within. And how can Anak watch here? Here is the seat of Satan in its webs, for in brain and heart and loins gates open behind Satan's seat to the city of Colgonusa, which is the spiritual fourfold London in the loins of Albion. Nels Milton fell through Albion's heart, traveling outside of humanity, beyond the stars and chaos and caverns of the moon and shell. But many of the Eternals rose up from eternal tables, drunk with a spirit, burning around the couch of that. They stood looking down into Beulah, wrath filled with rage. They ran the heavens round the watchers in a fiery circle, and around the shadowy eight, the eight close up the couch into a tabernacle and flee with cries down to the deeps, where Los opens his three wide gates surrounded by irration fires. They soon find their own place and join the watchers of the Uru. Love saw them and a cold pale horror covered over his limbs, pondering he knew that Rintra and Palamabra might depart, even as Reuben and Asclad gave up himself to tears. He sat down on his anvil stock and leaned upon the tree, looking into the black water mingling it with tears. At last, when desperation almost tore his heart in twain, he recollected an old prophecy in it and recorded, and often sang to the loud harp at the immortal feasts that Milton of the land of Albion should have ascend forwards from Uru, from the Bale of Felpa, and set free Orc from his chain of jealousy. He started at the thought, and down descended into Udan Adan, it was night, and Satan sat sleeping upon his couch in Udan Adan. His spectre slept, his shadow woke. When one sleeps, the other wakes. But Milton, entering my foot, I saw in the needed regions of the imagination. Also all men on earth and all in heaven saw in the needed regions of the imagination in Uru beneath Beulah the vast bridge of Milton's descent. But I knew not that it was Milton, for man cannot know what passes in his members till periods of space and time reveal the secrets of eternity. For more extensive than any other earthly things are man's earthly lining, and all this vegetable world appeared on my left foot as a bright sandal formed immortal of precious stones and gold. I stooped down and bound it on to walk forward through eternity. There is in Eden a sweet river of milk and liquid pearl named Ololum, on whose mild banks dwelt those who Milton drove down into Uru. And they wept in long resounding song for seven days of eternity, in the river's living banks, the mountains wail, and every plant that grew its solemn sighs lamented. When Lufus bulls each morning drag the sulphur sun out of the deep, harnessed with starry harness, black and shining, kept by black slaves that work all night at its starry harness, strong and vigorous, they drag the unwilling orb. At this time all the family of Eden heard the lamentation, and Providence began. But when the clarions of day sounded, they drowned the lamentations, and when night came, all was silent in Ololon, and all refused to lament in the still night, fearing lest they should others molest. Seven mornings lows heard them, as a poor bird within the shell hears its impatient parent bear, and an Itarmon heard them, but saw them not, for the blue moon then shell enclosed them in. And they lamented that they had in wrath and fury and fire driven Milton into the Uru. For now they knew too late that it was Milton, the Awakener. They had not heard the bar whose song called Milton to the attempt. And Lowe's heard these laments, he heard them calling prayer all the divine family. And he beheld the cloud of Milton stretching over Europe. 
but all the family divine collected as four sons in the four points of heaven, east, west, and north and south, enlarging and enlarging till their discs approach each other. And when they touched close together southward in one sun over Ololon, and as one man who weeps over his brother in a dark tomb, so all the family divine wept over Ololon, saying, Milton goes to eternal death. So saying, they groaned in spirit and were troubled. And again the divine family groaned in spirit. And Ololon said, Let us descend also, and let us give ourselves to death in Uro among the transgressors. Is virtue a punisher? Oh no! How is this wondrous thing? This wall beneath unseen before, this refuge from the walls of great eternity, unnatural refuge, unknown by us till now, or are these the pangs of repentance? Let us enter into them. Then the Divine Family said, Six thousand years are now accomplished in this world of sorrow. Milton's angel knew the universal dictate and you also feel this dictate, and now you know this world of sorrow and feel pity. Obey the dictate. Watch over this world, and with your broadening wings renew it to eternal life. Lo, I am with you always, but you cannot renew Milton. He goes to eternal death. So spake the family divine as one man, even Jesus uniting in one with Ololon and the appearance of one man, Jesus the Savior, appeared coming in the clouds of Ololon. Though driven away with the seven starry ones into the Uru, yet the divine vision remains everywhere forever. Amen. And Ololon lamented for Milton with a great lamentation, while those heard indistinct in fear, what time I bound my sandals on to walk forward through eternity. Lowe's descended to me, and Lowe's behind me stood, a terrible flaming sun, just close behind my back. I turned round in terror, and behold, Lowe's stood in that fierce glowing fire, and he also stooped down and bound my sandals on in Udan Adam. Trembling, I stood exceedingly with fear and terror, standing at the veil of Lambeth. But he kissed me and wished me health. And I became one man with him, arising in my strength. It was too late now to receive. Laws had entered into my soul. His terrors now possessed me whole. I arose in fury and strength. I am that shadowy prophet who six thousand years ago fell from my station in the eternal bosom. Six thousand years are finished. I return. Both time and space obey my will. I in six thousand years walk up and down. For not one moment of time is lost, nor one event of space unpermanent. But all remain. Every fabric of six thousand years remains permanent, though on the earth where Satan fell and was cut off, all things vanish and are seen no more. They vanish not from me and mine. We guard them first and last. The generations of men run on in the tide of time, but leave their destined lineaments permanent forever and ever. So spoke Lowe's as we went along to his supreme abode. Rintra and Palamabrom met us at the gate of Golgonusa, clouded with discontent and brooding in their minds terrible things. They said, O oh, Father most beloved, O oh, merciful parent, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty, to destroy. What sees his shadow terrible? Wherefore dost thou refuse to throw him into the furnaces? I know it's thou not that he will unchain Ork, and let loose Satan, Og, Sion, and Anak upon the body of Albion. For this he is come. Behold it written upon his feverous left foot black, most dismal to our eyes. The shadowy female shudders through heaven in torment inexpressible. 
and all the daughters of Lowe's prophetic wail, yet in the city weave a new religion from new jealousy of the autumn. Milton's religion is the cause, there is no end to destruction. Seeing the churches at their period in terror and despair, Ray have created Voltaire. Dilsa created Rousseau, asserting the self-righteousness against the universal saviour, mocking the confessors and martyrs, claiming self-righteousness with cruel virtue, making war upon the lambs redeemed to perpetuate war and glory, to perpetuate the laws of sin. They perverted Swedenborg's visions in Beulah and in Uru, to destroy Jerusalem as a harlot and her sons as reprobates, to raise up mystery the virgin harlot mother of war, Babylon the Great, the abomination of desolation. O oh, Swedenborg's strongest of men, the Samson churned by the churches, showing the transgressors in hell, the proud warriors in heaven, heaven as a punisher and hell as one under punishment with laws from Plato and his Greeks to renew the Trojan gods in Albion and to deny the value of the Saviour's blood. But then I raise up Whitefield, Palamabron raise up Westley, and these are the cries of the churches before the two witnesses. Faith in God, the dear Saviour who took on the likeness of men, becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross, the witnesses lie dead in the street of the great city. No faith is in all the earth. The book of God is trodden underfoot. He sent his two servants, Whitefield and Westley. Were they prophets or were they idiots or madmen? Show us miracles. Can you have greater miracles than this? Men who devote their lives whole comfort to entire scorn and injury and death, awake thou sleeper on the rock of eternity, Albion, awake. The trumpet of judgment had twice sounded. All nations are awake, but thou art still heavy and dull. Awake, Albion, awake. Lo, orc arises on the Atlantic. Lo, his blood and fire glow on America's shore. Albion turns upon his couch, he listens to the sounds of war, astonished and confounded. He weeps into the Atlantic deep, yet still in dismal dreams, unwakened, and the covering care advances from the east. How long shall we lay dead in the street of the great city? How long beneath the covering care of Kivo emanations? Milton will utterly consume us and thee, our beloved father. He had entered into the covering care, becoming one with Albion's dread sons, Han, Hyle, and Coven, surround him as a gilder. Wendelin and Conwena as a garment woven of war and religion. Let us descend and bring him chained to Polahula, O Father most beloved, O mild parent. Cruel in thy mildness, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty to destroy. All loves our beloved Father. Like the black storm coming out of chaos beyond the stars, it issues through the dark and intricate caves of the moon and shell, passing the planetary visions in the well adorned firmament, the sun rolls into chaos and the stars into the deserts. And then the storms become visible, audible and terrible, covering the light of day and rolling down upon the mountains, deluge all the country round. Such is a vision of loss, when Rintra and Palamaron spoke, and such his stormy face appeared, as does the face of heaven when covered with storms, pitying and loving though in frowns of terrible perturbation. But love dispares the clouds even as the strong winds of Jehovah, and love thus spoke. O oh, noble sons, be patient yet a little. I have embraced the falling dead. He has become one with me. O oh, sons, we live not by wrath, by mercy alone we live. I recollect an old prophecy in Eden recorded in gold, and oft sung to the harp. 
that Milton of the land of Albion should up ascend forward from Felpham's vale and break the chain of jealousy from all his roots. Be patient, therefore, O oh my sons. These lovely females from sweet night and silence and secret obscurities to hide from Satan's watchfinds, human loves and graces, lest they write them in their books and in the scroll of mortal life to condemn the accused who at Satan's bar trembled in spectrous bodies continually day and night, while on the earth they live in sorrowful vegetations. Oh, when shall we tread our wine presses in heaven, and reap our wheat with shoutings of joy, and leave the earth in peace? Remember how Calvin and Luther in fury premature sold war and stern division between papists and protestants, let it not be so now. O oh, go not forth in martyrdoms and wars. We were placed here by the universal brotherhood and mercy, with powers fitter to circumscribe this dark satanic threat, and that the seven eyes of God may have space for redemption. But how this is as yet we know not, and we cannot know, till Albion is arisen. Then, patient, wait a little while. Six thousand years are passed away, the end approaches fast. This mighty one is come from Eden. He is of the elect, who died from earth and his return before the judgment. This thing was never known, that one of the holy death should willing return. Then, patient, wait a little while, till the last vintage is over till we have quenched the son of Selah in the lake of Ud and Adam. O oh, my dear sons, leave not your father as your brethren left me. Twelve sons successive fled away in that thousand years of sorrow, of Palamabron's harrow, and of Rintra's wrath and fury. Reuben and Manasseh and Gad and Simeon and Levi and Ephraim and Judah were generated, because they left me, wandering with Tirza. And it harmon wept one thousand years, and all the earth was in a watery deluge. We call him Menasir, because of the generations of Tirza, because of Satan, and the seven eyes of God continually guard around him. But I, the fourth sower, am also said the watchman of eternity. The three are not and I am preserved, till my four mighty ones are left to me in Golgonusa, still Rintra fears, and Palamabron mild and piteous, the Ottoman filled with care, Bromion loving science. You, O oh my son, still guard round love. O oh, wander not and leave me, Rintra, Thou well rememberest when Amalek and Canaan fled with their sister Moab into that abhorred void. They became nations in our sight beneath the hands of Tirza. And Palamabron, thou rememberest when Joseph, an infant, stolen from his nurse's cradle wrapped in needlework of emblematic texture, was sold to the Amalekite, who carried him down into Egypt, where Ephraim and Menashe gathered my sons together in the sands of Midian. And if you also flee away and leave your father's side, following Milton into Uru, although your power is great, surely you also shall become poor mortal vegetations beneath the moon of Uru. Pity then your father's tear, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, I stood and saw Lazarus, who is the vehicular body of Albion, the redeemed, arise into the covering Caro, who is the spectre of Albion, by martyrdoms to suffer, to watch over the sleeping body. Upon his rock beneath his tomb I saw the covering care of divide fourfold into four churches when Lazarus arose. Paul, Constantine, Charlemagne, Luther. Behold, they stand before us, stretch over Europe and Asia. Come, all sons, come, come away. Arise, O sons, give all your strength against eternal death, lest we are vegetated, for cathedrals looms with only death, a web of death, 
and were it not for Bulahula and Alamanda, no human form, but only a fibrous vegetation. A polypus of soft affections, without thought or vision, must tremble in the heavens and earth through all the Uro space, throw all the vegetated mortars into Bulahula. But as to this selected form who is returned again, he is the signal that the last vintage now approaches, nor vegetation may go on till all the earth is free. So low spoke. Furious, they descended to Bolahul and Alamanda indignant. Unconvinced by Lowe's arguments and thunders rolling, they saw that wrath now swayed and now pity absorbed him as it was. So it remained in no hope of an end. Doglahul is named Law by mortals. Tharmas founded it because of Satan before Luban in the city of Golgonusa. But Golgonusa is named Art and manufactured by mortal men. In Bolahula, Lowe's anvil stand and his furnace is rage, thundering the hammers beat and the bellows blow loud, leaving self moving, mourning, lamenting and howling incessantly. Bolahula, through all its precious fields, though too fast founded its pillars and porticos to tremble at force of mortal or immortal arm, and softly lilling flutes accordant with the horrid labors make sweet melody. The bellows are the animal lungs, the hammers the animal heart, the furnaces the stomach for digestion, terrible their fury, thousands and thousands labor, thousands play on instruments stringed or fluted to ameliorate the sorrows of slavery. Loud sport the dancers in the dance of bed, rejoicing in carnage. The harp and hammers are lulled by the flutes, lula lula, the bellowing furnace is black by the long sounded clarion. The double drum drowns howls and groans, the shrill five shrieks and cries. The crooked horn mellows, the hoarse raving serpent, terrible but harmonious. Bola hula is his stomach in every individual man. Loth is by mortals named time. And its armon is named space. By day depict him bold and aged, who is in eternal youth, all powerful, and his locks flourish like the brows of morning. He is the spirit of prophecy, the ever apparent Elias. Time is the mercy of eternity. Without time's swiftness, which is the swiftest of all things, all were eternal torment. All the gods of the kingdoms of earth labor in Lowe's halls. Everyone is a fallen son of the spirit of prophecy. He is the four Zoa that stood around the throne divine. Loud shout the sons of Luva at the wine presses as Lowe descended with Rintra and Palamabron in his fires of resistless fury. The wine press on the Rhine groans loud but all its central beams act more terrific in the central cities of the nations where human thought is crushed beneath the iron hand of power. There Lowe's puts all into the press, the oppressor and the oppressed together, ripe for the harvest and vintage and ready for the loom. They sang at the vintage, this is the last vintage, and seed shall no more be sown upon earth, till all the vintage is over and all gathered in, till the plough has passed over the nations and the harrow and heavy thundering roller upon the mountains. And loud the souls howl round the porches of Golgonusa, crying, O oh God, deliver us to the heavens or to the earth, that we may preach righteousness and punish the sinner with death. But Lowe's refused, till all the vintage of earth was gathered in. And Lowe stood and cried to the laborers of the vintage in voice of all. Fellow laborers, the great vintage and harvest is now upon earth, the whole extent of the globe is explored. Every scattered atom of human intellect now is flocking to the sound of the trumpet. All the wisdom which was hidden in caves and dens from ancient time is now sought out from animal and vegetable and mineral. 
the awakener is come a stretch over Europe. The vision of God is fulfilled. The ancient man upon the rock of Albion awakes. He listens to the sounds of war, astonished and ashamed. He sees his children mock at faith, deny providence. Therefore you must bind the ships not by nations or families. You shall bind them in three classes. According to their classes, so you shall bind them. Separating what has been mixed since men began to be woven into nations by Rahab and Tirza, since Albion's dead and Satan's cutting off from our awful fields, when under pretense to benevolence the elect subdued all from the foundations of the world. The elect is one class. You shall bind them separate. They cannot believe in eternal life, except by miracle in the new birth. The other two classes, the reprobate who never ceases to believe, and the redeemed, who live in doubts and fears perpetually tormented by the elect, this you shall bind in a twin bundle for the consummation. But the elect must be saved from fires of eternal death, to be formed into the churches of Beulah, that they destroy not the earth. For in every nation and every family the three classes are born, And in every species of air, metal, tree, fish, bird and beast, we form the mundane air, that spectres coming by fury or amity, all is the same, and everyone remains in his own energy. Go forth, reapers, with rejoicing, you sow in tears, by the time of your refreshing comet. Only a little moment still abstain from pleasure and rest in the labors of eternity, and you shall reap the whole earth from pole to pole, from sea to sea, beginning at Jerusalem's inner court, Lambeth ruined and given to the detestable cults of Priam, to Apollo, and at the asylum given to Hercules, who labored in Tirsus' looms for bread, who set pleasure against duty who create Olympic crowns to make learning a burden and the work of the Holy Spirit strife. The Thor and cruel Odin who first read the polar caves. Lambe mourns calling Jerusalem. She weeps and looks abroad for the Lord's coming, that Jerusalem may overspread all nations. Grave not for the mortal and perishing delights, but leave them to the weak and pity the weak as your infant care. Break not forth in your wrath, lest you also are vegetated by tears. Wait till the judgment is past, till the creation is consumed, and then rush forward with me into the glorious spiritual vegetation, the supper of the Lamb and his bride, and the awakening of Albion, our friend and ancient companion. So low spoke but lightnings of discontent broke on all sides round, and murmurs of thunder rolling heavy, long and loud over the mountains, while Lowe's called his sons around him to the harvest and the vintage. Thou seest the constellations in the deep and wondrous night. They rise in order and continue their immortal courses upon the mountains and in veils with harp and heavenly song, with flute and clarion, with cups and measures filled with foaming wine, glittering the streams reflect the vision of beautitude, and the calm ocean joys beneath and smooths his awful waves. These are the sun blows, and these the laborers of the vintage. Thou seest the gorgeous cloth flies that dance at sport in summer upon the sunny brooks and meadows, Everyone the dance knows in his intricate mazes of delight artful to weave. Each one to sound his instruments of music in the dance, to touch each other and receive, to cross and change and return. These are the children of Lowe's. Thou seest the trees and mountains. The wind blows heavy, loud they thunder through the darksome sky, uttering prophecies and speaking instructive words to the sons of men. These are the sons of love. These, the visions of eternity. 
but we see only as it were the hem of their garments when with our vegetable eyes we view these wondrous visions. There are two gates through which all souls descend, one southward from Dover Cliff to Lizard Point, the other toward the north, Caithness and Rocky Turnus, Fentland and John Groat's house. The souls descending to the body wail on the right hand of Lowe's, and Dove's delivered from the body on the left hand, for Lowe's against the east his force continually bends along the valleys of Middlesex from Hounslow to Blackheath, lest those three heavens of Beulah should creation destroy, and lest they should descend before the north and south gates groaning with pity. He among the wailing sons laments, and this the labors of the sons of Lowe's in Alamanda and in the city of Golgonusa, and in Lubin, and around the lake of Udan Island, in the forest of Enchithon Benithon, where souls incessant to wail, being piteous, passions and desires, with neither lineament nor form, but like to watery clouds. The passions and desires descend upon the hungry winds, for such alone slippers remain mere passion and appetite. The sons of Lowe's clothe them, and feed and provide houses and fields, and every generated body in its inward form is a garden of delight and a building of magnificence built by the sons of Lowe's in Bulahul and Alamanda, and the herbs and flowers and furniture and beds and chambers continually woven in the looms of Anitarmon's daughters in bright cathedral's golden dome with care and love and tears. For the various classes of men are all marked out to determinate in Bulahula. And as the spectres choose their affinities, so they are born on earth. And every class is determinate, but not by natural, but by spiritual power alone. Because the natural power continually seeks and tends to destruction ending in death, which would of itself be eternal death. And all are classed by spiritual and not by natural power. End of part two.